Welcome to the Mama Say Fit podcast. In today's episode, we will be talking with Dr. Jordan Hubbard all about tongue ties. Welcome to the Mama Say Fit podcast. This is Gina, perinatal fitness trainer and birth doula. And this is Roxanne, labor and delivery nurse and student midwife. And this is the Mama Say Fit podcast, where we empower you on your prenatal fitness, birth, and postpartum return to fitness journey. Our podcast shares how to move throughout your pregnancy to stay strong and comfortable. Pain is not a requirement of pregnancy. Understand the science of birth and how to approach recovery after birth. We share our personal experiences as mothers navigating the stage of lives, plus our professional expertise as birth workers and fitness professionals. Our goal is to help you feel confident as you navigate the perinatal time frame for an empowering pregnancy, positive birth, and postpartum journey. We are glad to have you with us on this journey and that you've chosen us to support you. Dr. Jordan Hubbard is the owner of Hubbard Dental for almost the past three years. During this time period, she accidentally found her passion within her career of functional dentistry with a concentration in tethered oral issues and airway management. It was after her second child had breastfeeding issues that she was propelled into the world of ties and functional dentistry. She has since then taken countless hours of continuing education classes with the industry leaders. She uses a Solea CO2 laser in her practice and has already successfully treated many patients since opening this side of her clinic in November of 2022. So thanks for being here with us today, Dr. Hubbard. And we also have Casey here with us to talk about the myofascial perspective of tongue ties. Hey guys, it's Dr. Hubbard. Thanks for having me. Hey, this is Casey Backus, physical therapist and yoga instructor. I have about 18 years in the field of physical therapy, and I will be focusing more on the myofascial components of tongue tie and how that can create some holistic impact. So in the postpartum period, you may have heard about tongue ties, especially in relation to breastfeeding. When breastfeeding, one of the most important factors is how well milk is removed, because if milk is not removed, your milk supply can suffer, and we may experience things like clogged ducts, which could lead to mastitis, which is an infection within the clogged duct. Milk is removed based on baby's latch. If you're choosing to nurse, if you're using a pump, it depends on like the flange size of your pump. And baby's latch can depend on a number of factors, such as just simply how are they positioned to the breast. So if they're turned to the side where they're like torquing in their neck, it might be a little hard for them to have a good latch. And other things such as body tension or oral restrictions can also influence how well they can move their tongue and jaw, which are things that are going to influence how well they can remove milk from the breast. So to start, Dr. Hubbard, could you let us know what a tongue tie is and why is this important or even relevant to the postpartum time frame? A tongue tie or a tethered oral tissue, because there are different types of ties within the mouth, is actually a fascial restriction. So fascia within the body is a very tight tissue, one that cannot be stretched or pulled. It has to either be broken or cut in order to remove the restriction. So a tongue tie is when there's abnormal amount of restriction or fascia in the tongue, making it so it cannot dissociate itself from the floor of the mouth and cannot move independently. This is a huge deal because the tongue is one of the main players in removing milk from the breast. The tongue has to move in a specific sequence to allow for suction to occur for the milk to come out. And if the tongue cannot move in that sequence adequately, you'll not have complete drainage. Are there different types of ties that a baby could have? Yes. So the big ones that we look for as providers are one, of course, the tongue tie, and that would be located under the tongue between the tongue and the floor of the mouth. We also check for a lip tie, and typically this is seen on the upper lip between the lip and where the teeth would be in a baby. There are also lower lip ties. They are very less common and typically are only treated in adults, but there are also buckle ties. Buckle ties, while they are extremely rare, can cause a lot of tension and body issues in the baby, and those are located in the cheeks, kind of between where the cheek and the back teeth would come together. So how can a tongue tie affect breastfeeding? So like I said before, the tongue is a big player on how suction is created in the mouth. And if a tongue cannot move freely, especially in the posterior aspect of the tongue, complete breast drainage cannot occur. We want the tongue to undulate or basically move in a wave-like motion inside the mouth so that suction can be created and milk can be removed from the breasts. If the entire tongue cannot move up and down the way it should, it will kind of be stuck at the bottom of the mouth and the lips of the baby will be used to try to pull out milk. One, that's very tiring on the baby, but that can also be extremely painful for the mother and it is not an appropriate way to breastfeed. What other things could a tongue tie affect in like a baby? 
With babies specifically, tongue ties can cause a lot of tension. So the fascia that connects the tongue there is actually part of the deep myofascial line that runs from the tongue all the way down to the toes in the body. And so if this is restricted, it can cause a lot of tension in the baby. And I think Casey can speak more to this. So talk about myofascial lines. The deep myofascial line specifically was described by Thomas Myers in his book and in his kind of school of thought, Anatomy Trains. And it's not something specifically that came out of physical therapy school for me. It was something that I learned in yoga trainings, but really kind of fascinating to think about how connective tissue really is linking different parts of the body. And so the deep myofascial line from the base of the tongue running down the front of the neck. So the front of the neck can have tension and restriction in movement, which is really important for for babies, especially acquiring those early milestones from tummy time to working on some of the pre-sitting, pre-crawling, and eventually walking. So down the front of the throat and then down through the abdomen to the diaphragm, which is huge in terms of breath control and establishing healthy breath rhythms. And then down from the diaphragm across the hip flexors, which the psoas muscles, they uh, get a lot of popularity in the fitness world for being tight, which that concept is shifting a bit. But the hip flexors are very important muscles in mobility because they connect the legs to the trunk. And then also the pelvic floor. So we know that pelvic floor tension and jaw and tongue tension really have a big connection. And so this can affect not just babies in their development, as we often focus on, but moms in terms of laboring their babies and their pelvic floors being willing to open for birth. So big implications really for every body that um, has a tongue and a pelvic floor. So that's all of us. So my two children had a tongue tie and they had to get them revised during our breastfeeding journey. And one of the things after my first was diagnosed with a tongue tie was I was feeling like everyone had a tongue tie. So like all of a sudden there was every one of my friends was like, yeah, we had to get our tongue tie revised. So I was like, is it really a tongue tie or is like, how are all of these kids having this tongue tie all of a sudden? Like, how did evolution allow this to happen? All Like these babies are not able to breastfeed. Like this could not have been a thing like back in the day, you know, like when we lived in caves and stuff, tongue ties, like those babies probably would not have survived. So why all of a sudden are there so many tongue tie diagnosis? Like how did we survive all these years without tongue tie revisions? So we actually have evidence dating back to the early 1600s of midwives having longer nails on their pinky fingers to snip ties underneath babies' tongues um, to help with breastfeeding. So this has been around for a very long time, but has, you are correct, gained recent popularity. One, that could be because there's more education being brought about it. It's being talked about and discussed more. But also there's been a shift in the population trying to go back to how things were before. You know, there has been a shift in wanting to be a little bit more holistic, getting back to the breast, seeing the importance of that connection. When there are problems, we find a way to solve them. Um, One of the theories on tongue ties right now is its relationship to folic acid and not just folic acid, but folate, methylfolate, lots of folates. Folate in general prevents apoptosis or programmed cell death. And so programmed cell death is important. We need it for a lot of aspects of our life. We don't want it to get out of control. And sometimes when it can get out of control, we get things like neural tube defects. So in the early 90s, um, I believe it was the early 90s, it may have been the late 80s, doctors started recommending pregnant women take folic acid during pregnancy to prevent things like neural tube defects, spina bifida. What they didn't prepare for is that it's going to decrease apoptosis elsewhere, like in tongues. When you look at it from a risk balance perspective, it's a lot easier to clip a tongue tie than it is to cure spina bifida. And so it's a consequence that we put up with. Typically for babies with tongue ties, it's an easy 30 second procedure that can be handled. But it's being talked about now because all those babies from the late 80s, early 90s are now adults. And we're seeing a lot more issues like sleep apnea, uncontrolled anxiety, crazy amounts of migraines, head and neck tension, people seeking care for all these other bodily issues, and it leads us to say why. Let's look at the functional aspect of things and what is leading to all these other causes, which brings us back to the tongue tie. So one of the things when we talk about baby's development, and we talk specifically about apoptosis, is when we talk about programmed cell death, it means the body essentially taking away parts of the body that aren't going to be necessary or functional. And we see that or most notably on hands and feet. So initially, we know babies' hands and feet are webbed, and then the body has apoptosis or programmed cell death to come in and take away that tissue that's in between the fingers. 
from a PT perspective, that's the way that I have understood the tongue ties, most specifically that apoptosis is, and most recently, thanks to Dr. Hubbard, is that that tissue that tethers the tongue to the bottom and the lip, that that tissue essentially should have been programmed to die or to disappear. So those tethers with the increases in folate and methylfolate and folic acid were not necessarily getting that. And so those tongues are remaining tethered and when we wouldn't otherwise want that to happen or where that's not exactly as functional as we would hope. When looking at weighing the risks and benefits to would I rather have my baby have a tongue tie or be at risk for spina bifida, it's very clear what the answer is there. And so even if we look at removing folic acid methylfolate from supplements, it's still going to be in our everyday lives. So it sounds like what you're saying that it it is very beneficial to still continue to take your folic acid or your folate or whatever variation of it is within your prenatal vitamin because the potential risk of developing spina bifida is significantly more than developing a tongue tie because the procedures involved with trying to correct spina bifida probably either don't exist or they're not as easy as just clipping a tongue tie. That's exactly right. So this is just purely anecdotal and nutrition is outside of my scope, so I'm not giving nutrition advice. There's the caveat. But the neural tube develops within the first three to six weeks, so maybe there's something to be looked at for later stages of pregnancy. From a conversational standpoint, (laughs) it has gotten me looking at other vitamins and minerals that have changed in the last 50 years from what we're taking because maybe this is something not just folic acid related, but vitamin D related. We're not outside as much as we were before, things like that. So again, these are all theories that have come up in the tongue tie world that are still being investigated. So there are multiple nutrients that are involved with the neural tube development. And so trying to omit just one because of the concern with tongue ties is probably not appropriate as well, because there's so many things that contribute towards our baby's development and that are beneficial throughout our pregnancy. And there's still a lot of like new research that's coming out on even what the current recommendation should be. And so we're definitely not saying to stop taking your prenatal vitamins or to try to omit anything out of your diet due to the concern of tongue ties and how it may affect your postpartum and your breastfeeding experience. So I also feel like there's probably a little bit of a genetic component with tongue ties because both my kids had tongue ties. And I mean, I believe I have one. It's not been diagnosed, but my husband definitely has something going on with his tongue because his family also had like nephews on his side of the family had some tongue tie issues. So like, I feel like it also has to be not just like, oh, you took folate, so now you your kids are going to have a tongue tie, but it probably has a genetic component as well, if you wanted to touch on that. You're absolutely correct. It is developmental, and so development has a lot to do with genetics. And typically what I see in my practice is that if a baby has a tie, I can look at mom or dad, and once we talk more about ties, it's something easily seen from the outside world. And so you are correct. You know, I've been doing this only for six months or so, but I've been studying this for over two years, and it is something that runs in families. So does everyone need their tongue tie revised? And I know Casey, as an adult, is also wanting to do a revision, and Roxanne's done tongue tie revisions with her children. But what are some signs and symptoms that someone may be experiencing that you would recommend a tongue tie revision in, like, a generality? Obviously, like, individuals should get diagnosis and treatment plans from their individual providers, but what would be, like, a general recommendation First of all, when looking for a provider for tongue ties, check their education. This is not something providers are taught in school, and so not everyone is able to diagnose a tongue tie. While you should seek a provider with experience, few things to look for are training with some of the industry leaders, one being Dr. Zaghi. He is an ENT and is very good in airway. Dr. Richard Baxter as well. Um, They are both some of my mentors and do fabulous trainings. There are many, many other providers who do amazing courses, but those are the two that I have major respect for. They are industry leaders. They are putting out research. They're doing a great job with education. So please check your provider's education and what they carry with them to perform correct diagnosis. As far as symptoms go, symptoms for babies can be painful, breastfeeding, very gassy, severe reflux, fussy, colicky babies. Typically, babies don't need to be put on reflux medication, so if that's something a pediatrician has advised for you, seek a second opinion from a tethered oral tissue provider. 
Also with babies, taking too long at the breast or falling asleep while eating is a big sign of a tie, as well as mastitis and complete breast drainage from mom. Those are big signs as well. In children, you will notice speech issues. You'll notice ADHD diagnoses that are sometimes misdiagnosed. You may also notice bedwetting at nighttime. Continuing into the childhood years, that can be a sign of a tie. With adults, you'll notice things like sleep apnea, migraines, head and neck tension, even things like plantar fasciitis, GI issues. With adults, things get a little bit more complicated because we've compensated our whole lives with a tie, and now our bodies have actually changed anatomy to try to adapt. And so it can be a myriad of issues, but those are some of the most common ones. Of course, the main one that you see through all three stages of life would be sleep disordered breathing. And that's a huge one because it means your body isn't getting the oxygen it needs at nighttime in order to grow, develop, create memories, sleep, feel better, all of those things. And so sleep disordered breathing is a major issue in our population today. And if you see signs in a baby, such as open mouth breathing or noisy breathing, that's a, that's a big issue. So do I hear you correctly saying they're not going to grow out of this? You are correct. <laughs> you cannot grow out of a tie. You can compensate for that tie, like I said, and the degree of compensation varies. But there has not been a case I know of that has zero symptoms, even into their 80s, with ties. So one thing that I wanted to mention just with Dr. Hubbard reviewing the symptoms, some of the big things are like the developmental milestones that will catch somebody or kind of flag someone for a referral, the speech issues or speech delay, you said that not gaining weight oh, and sitting up. Yeah. So some of those milestones, my kids actually fell outside of that zone. And so now my kids are a little bit older, but still kind of dealing with, I think, tie related issues. Dr. Hubbard's working with us to help resolve and come up with a plan. But it's an interesting thing because we were told essentially like, no, they're gaining weight or like, look at how well they talk. There's no issues. And I kept thinking like, oh, they're really noisy breathers. And so recently we were sent down the route of ENT, which is definitely a collaborative part of management for tethered oral tissue. But the immediate response was take the tonsils and adenoids out. And so there can be some varied perspectives out there that you can remove oral tissue. Obviously, I'm not an ENT, but you can remove that oral tissue. But without that physical therapy of the tongue and the potentially releasing of the ties, we're not going to have the most functional airway speech breathing, um, movement, even capacity. So really leaning into that more holistic management where you kind of have a whole team that's supporting, even if your child doesn't have apparent deficits, because you can definitely have kids like mine that fall through the cracks, I think, that are still quite impaired or could benefit totally. Another thing when thinking of getting ties revised is a lot of the industry leaders as well as myself believe that this should not be a surgery that's performed just because. You should be showing signs and symptoms of the tie. We do not want tie releases to get a bad name or to feel like they are a fad or to say, oh, people are just doing this for the money. No, there is a time and place to release a tie. And with that comes a show of symptoms. And again, like Casey spoke to, it is a collaboration between medical disciplines. You know, for our babies, we get IBCLCs involved as well as body workers, chiropractic care. For our teens and adults, we get myofunctional therapy, possible ENT referrals. This is definitely not a one-stop shop, and it is a collaborative effort. Let's take a break from this week's episode to hear about our sponsors. Crossover Symmetry offers world-class training and equipment for pain, fitness, and performance. We have a crossover symmetry shoulder system on every power rack in our gym because it has been so beneficial for our perinatal clients to support their shoulder health. Crossover symmetry provides shoulder bands with several types of attachments, such as a door anchor for home or travel use, squat rack attachments, and also wall mounts. In addition to their equipment, crossover symmetry offers training programs to guide you to strong, pain-free shoulders and even a four-week postpartum program created by yours truly. Crossover symmetry is our chosen brand in the gym and we recommend them to all our clients. Check them out at crossoversymmetry.com and use code Mama Stay Fit for 20% off your own system. 
Needed is a nutrition company focused on providing optimal nourishment for the perinatal journey. Did you know that during pregnancy, you need upwards of 100 grams of protein a day to support your pregnancy? The type of protein you consume also matters. Collagen is an optimal form of protein for pregnancy. It has the right amino acids to support skin stretching as your belly grows, as well as recovery from birth, whether vaginal or cesarean. Most of us don't consume enough collagen in our diet, and this is where a high quality supplement comes in. Needed makes my favorite collagen protein for the perinatal stage. Needed's collagen is also third body tested for heavy metals, which is important for any supplement you are consuming during pregnancy and postpartum. To get started with Needed's collagen, head to thisisneeded.com and use code MAMASTAYPOD for 20% off your first three months of Needed. So I had my both my kids' tongue ties revised, and I had them later. So with my daughter, we immediately had terrible pain with nursing. I thought something was wrong. Everyone was like, just do a deeper latch. She'll be fine. Like, she's not tongue-tied. Like, we saw an ENT or a pediatrician, and I think we even saw, like, a lactation consultant who was like, no, like, she doesn't have oral tissues or oral tethered tissues. So I was like, something is wrong. Like, I should not cringe every time I go to breastfeed my baby. But this tongue tie thing, like not like there's no way, like not every kid can have a tongue tie. There has to be some other thing going on. And I was very hesitant to do a tongue tie. One, I mean, like it's a procedure on a baby. Like I was very concerned, like maybe like she doesn't have a tongue tie and then I cut her frenulum and then like she ends up having issues because now that frenulum was helping her maintain function. And now like she has to figure out how to use her tongue without it. So we we saw like a ton of body workers prior to for like three months. We saw like a chiropractor weekly. She's got cranial sacral body work weekly for like three months. And it helped. Like it was her latch was getting better, but it was only a band-aid. Eventually, when we started to space out her appointments, it's her latch, her bad latch came back and it was very painful again. And that's when we decided to do her revision. And I know that there's like benefits on doing like the body work prior to doing the like the revision anyway, like doing body work prior to revision, working with like myofunctional therapists and other professionals is helpful. But my hesitancy was not because I was like, oh, she needs body work prior to getting this revision. I was just like, there's no way she has a tongue tie. Like it has to be something else. Like my kids don't have tongue ties. They're fine. And then with my second, he, his latch was beautiful. Like he, not painful at all. Like I had no issues with his pain, like with his latch and he drained me just fine, but he had terrible reflex and such bad colic where he would stay awake for like three to four hours at night, just crying, which very exhausting for a mom. And eventually like their cry gets, you just can't listen to it for very long. So I'm like, something's wrong. So we again, started the process of like, he must have a tongue tie. He was such a noisy breather from like birth, like two weeks old, like breathing through his nose. But it was like, he had like just inhaled a bunch of water and it just sounded so noisy. We went to his pediatrician, sent us to an ENT. There was no lactation consultants that I could find in the area to do an assessment. So we just kind of went to a dentist. We did like some body work prior to, but just all of these referrals, it was like two and a half months before we got his revision done. And again, his latch was always fine and he was always like gaining weight on the smaller side. Like he was always like around the 10th percentile for weight and they just attributed it to his reflux. And after the revision, it didn't really like crazy jump back up to. So he's just kind of stayed small, but I feel like it did benefit him like he wasn't as like colicky I guess I feel like he's still dealing with issues from just the tongue tie so like sometimes the revision may not be enough so like what I guess what would you recommend so my daughter's revision was done with scissors a dentist um just at an army hospital after I cried for an hour on the phone with a dentist and then my second one was done at a dentist that used a laser I don't know what type of laser though So does it matter like how the tongue tie was revised, whether it was scissors or a laser? What is the difference, I guess, between the two? And then what would you recommend doing afterwards after the revision, I guess? So a couple things that caught my attention when you were speaking. First of all, saying the symptoms came back, there could be some reattachment there. Reattachment occurs when stretches post-procedure aren't either done properly or aren't done enough. And reattachment can make symptoms worse, actually. And so it's not always necessarily how the stretches were done, but how your provider was trained. And this goes back to kind of vetting your providers and making sure they have the education that they need. Because an incomplete phrenectomy is called a phrenotomy. And this is where the research talks about a lot of things as this phrenotomy. 
A phrenotomy is actually an incomplete release. And so if you look at the research, there's a lot of quote unquote research that talks about how tongue tie releases don't really do anything because they're specifically referring to phrenotomies. A phrenectomy or a frenuloplasty is removing all of the fascia down to the genioglossus muscle or the tongue muscle. And so if you have an incomplete release done, absolutely your child may still be experiencing and exhibiting signs and symptoms of a tongue tie because it was not handled correctly in the first place. This is a very big issue with providing using scissors instead of a laser. So using scissors doesn't allow the provider to have a clear field of view because there is nothing to mitigate bleeding there. Using a laser helps with that. Now, not all lasers are created equally. A CO2, a carbon dioxide laser, is the only laser that should be used for phrenectomy procedures because it has minimal heat, so it's not going to damage underlying structures like the muscle. And it also allows for a clean field of view because it kind of cauterizes. Um, it doesn't really cauterize. I don't want to use that term, but that's a very plain English term that's easy to understand. So it allows for less bleeding to occur so the provider can see what they're doing appropriately and ensure a complete release, ensure the release of all the fascia down to the genioglossus muscle. Then, once a complete release is done, as long as stretches are performed correctly, you should have very nice healing. The reattachment could cause a return of symptoms, and sometimes a second revision is necessary in those cases. It's rare, but it does happen, and having a provider who can get you to the appropriate specialists for aftercare helps reduce the risk of reattachment. So, Dr. Hubbard, from a parent perspective, what questions should a parent be asking in terms of the procedure to make sure that, you know, that the best possible outcome? First and foremost, ask the provider what kind of laser they're using. Again, a CO2 laser is the only laser that should be used for tongue tie releases. Some brands of that include Celea, Light Scalpel, DECA. There are a few others, but those are the big ones that are talked about. Another thing to ask the provider is how many of these have they done and what success stories do they have? You know, hearing from other parents of the outcomes that they've had is a good indication of how well the release was performed. And also ask them what their education is. Ask them when the last class they had was on this. You would want it to be within the last year to make sure they're staying up to date on the research. But also, like I said, the big names, the Breathe Institute, the Tongue Tie Academy, those are big names in the release world and having education from those is helpful. There are many others out there and it's hard for me to name all of them, but ensuring that your provider is up to date with the newest research and staying current on the education is, is huge. Is it ever too late to get a tongue tie revised? What's that saying? Like better late than never. Um, so no, it's never too late. But do you know that releasing adults is a whole different ballgame than releasing infants. Releasing adults, you have to look at all the other compensations that have occurred. Is there enough space? How is their tongue tone? What does their nasal passage look like? Tell me about the adenoids and tonsils. And sometimes other surgeries are needed. Sometimes adults need surgeries to go through expansion to create enough space for the tongue. Sometimes they need ENTs to get involved before we can release the tongue. So it's never too late, but know that the longer you wait, the more comes with getting the results that you're hoping for. Can you just touch on briefly the connection of, let's say someone doesn't plan to breastfeed, or let's say it's someone like my kids, they were gaining weight, fine, that wasn't really an issue. Can you touch on like if someone is maybe past the breastfeeding, like how important is the position of the tongue? How does that impact the oral spaces, the teeth crowding, braces, things like that? Can you talk about why it might be important after initial... Yeah, so we want the tongue to rest up on the roof of the mouth, which is essentially the floor of the nose. And when the tongue rests up there, it actually holds space for the teeth. So in kids, in babies, when they have their baby teeth, we want for those teeth to be spaced out properly. Having a infant, one under five, with all their baby teeth still, if those teeth are all crowded together, it's likely that their tongue is not resting on the roof of their mouth, which is causing a high vault or a high arch, and the teeth are coming together. This won't allow for their tongue to be on the roof of their mouth, and it's going to impact breathing. It can also cause a deviated septum, which is going to create inadequate air moving through the nose. And so when looking at braces and orthodontic work, the tongue is actually the best player in all of that. The tongue is the strongest muscle in the body. And if it is attached in a way that it shouldn't be and cannot sit on the roof of the mouth, your child is more likely to have crowded teeth. 
Not only that, but if it's sitting on the floor of the mouth and not up on the roof of the mouth where it should be, they also may be biting the sides of their tongue or causing other trauma to the tongue itself that can be seen at dental appointments. So then that's where the airway contribution is when we come into thinking about nose breathing, breathing in that humidified air. Many of us probably experience that kind of feeling wearing masks um, during the pandemic that, you know, it's just not ideal for us to have our breathing impaired. And so ideally the tongue's on the roof of the mouth supporting the floor of the nose so that we can breathe in through the nose, connect with the diaphragm, which is that big broadband sheath of muscle that separates the lungs, heart and lungs from the abdominal cavity. And the way that the diaphragm moves is actually mirrored in the pelvic floor. And so we can really look at jaw, breathing, diaphragm, breathing, and then pelvic floor. And even if we really want to do maybe another podcast, (laughs) the arches of the feet and really how that's just not a concert, what's the word, like an orchestra Mm -hmm. of body tissues that really in a happy body that's breathing well and generally pain-free and most functional, that those are working together. So something else that I've noticed with like my own children, and we haven't had any tongue ties revised and we didn't really have like a ton of issues breastfeeding outside of my first daughter. We had some initial latch issues, but then it resolved after like a week or so. But my daughter snores at night and she actually has more cavities compared to my son who we had like zero issues breastfeeding like from the start, never had a clogged duct, never had anything to indicate that he had an oral issue. But when he sleeps, he sleeps with his mouth closed and they brush their teeth just about the same and he has no cavities at all. And so is there a correlation between mouth breathing that could be related to a tongue tie and the development of cavities in children? Yes, absolutely. And this is true for adults as well. Bacteria that cause cavities thrive in a damp environment. So when you have that air coming into the mouth and it's making it a little bit drier and saliva isn't flowing as freely, the bacteria that cause cavities is going to proliferate. It's going to go everywhere. And people who are mouth breathers inherently have more cavities than those who don't. And so mouth breathing is the first sign of sleep disordered breathing, which will eventually turn into sleep apnea later in life. And if we can correct that in children, we can save them from so many issues later on in life. So I think it's an important distinction that you're making here and that this conversation is kind of opening up, which is a misnomer that sleep apnea is somehow a disease of middle age men or like later in life, if you gain weight, you're going to have sleep apnea or, oh, I only snore when I'm pregnant, that we can really start to if I'm hearing you correctly and my understanding is correct, that we can predict who will have a diagnosis of sleep apnea based on some of these pediatric breathing habits and um, how the mouth looks. Is that correct in terms of sleep apnea? I believe so, 100%, absolutely. I will probably get pushback from the ENT community on this uh, if they are not airway trained as I have been through Dr. Zaghi, but absolutely, yes. We actually have cases where we have seen mouth breathing starting in a baby, and I believe this child was age six and was diagnosed with severe obstructive sleep apnea. So while it's most common in middle age, older men, and that's typically due to weight gain, right? Sleep apnea doesn't necessarily just come from a tongue tie. It can come from other factors as well. The tongue tie, yes, can cause obstructive sleep apnea in certain populations, and it is something to be taken extremely seriously. And so just so that we're clear, sleep apnea is not strictly snoring. You can snore without sleep apnea, but sleep apnea being the actual pausing of breathing and then kind of gasping to when the when the brain triggers the body to take a breath. So not all snoring is sleep apnea, correct? It's hard for me to say if not all snoring is sleep apnea. Snoring is a sign of sleep disordered breathing. It's a sign that your body isn't receiving oxygen well. And so someone may not be diagnosed with sleep apnea and still be snoring. They may have upper airway resistance syndrome, or they may be in those first stages of just sleep disordered breathing. It's not necessarily tied to sleep apnea, but it is a sign that something's wrong. So I'm just throwing my husband under the bus. He snores so bad, so bad. Sorry, honey, if you are listening. 
I mean, he definitely has, like, some sort of ties. Like, he has, like, the ones in the cheeks, the buckle ties, I think. I mean, we just looked at his mouth. I'm not a dentist in any sort of way. I was like, that's not normal, I don't think. Um, And he snores so bad that I tell him, like, you need to go get assessed by, like, some sleep person because, like, there's no way that this could be normal. When he was a kid, he saw a speech therapist because he was unable to say, like, certain letters. I think F is the only one I can remember. And they just, it was like another thing that a kid, like all kids have to see some sort of speech therapist for letters. And obviously this was like the 1990s. Nobody saw tongue ties were not a thing. But he also had to get braces when he was a kid. And so like, I feel like his mouth and jaw is very narrow. So do you think like tongue tie that's not revised could potentially lead to like orthodontics needs that could then impair future like revisions, I guess? Bringing my own story into this, so I have a posterior tie, and I know we haven't kind of talked about types of ties, but posterior ties are the hardest to diagnose, and unless someone is highly educated in the field, won't be able to find one. My tongue looks completely normal to the outside world, but I have an extremely high arched palate. I have tons of head and neck tension, migraines. I can't touch my toes, even if I really work on it with my yoga practice. All of these things that are signs of ties, but I was never diagnosed. I've also been through four rounds of braces and two sets of expansion, and I never was able to hold it there. And knowing what I know now is because my tongue cannot rest on the roof of my mouth properly. And so I've had this collapse occur every time after I'm done with braces. And so your husband is likely in that category. If the tongue tone is not there, that that's what we develop properly with myofunctional therapy when paired with a tie. If the tone is not there to hold this space, he will have relapse. So it seems like the tongue tie is potentially like the starter or the trigger for a lot of long-term issues in the future. But what if somebody doesn't want to correct a tongue tie? And so I never had my children assessed for tongue ties because we didn't really have a lot of issues. And now with my daughter, we're seeing more issues that could be related to airway health. But the biggest concern for me and the concern that I heard from a lot of my clients was the pain associated with the revision. Like, I don't want to put my baby through pain for like my own, for lack of a better word, like ease and comfort with breastfeeding. So is there a reason to not correct a tongue tie or what if you don't want to correct a tongue tie? What other options does somebody have? First of all, anything in the healthcare industry, you never have to do. And if a provider makes you feel like you have to do something, I urge you to seek another provider. You have full autonomy over yours and your children's bodies, and that should be something that you hold near and dear to your heart. Never feel pressured to do something that you don't feel comfortable with or you don't want to do. Speaking from a provider's perspective, I only treat if you are having symptoms, and I believe that's how we should treat anything, but going back to the root cause is always appropriate. We never want to put a Band-Aid on things. You know, we want to figure out why something is occurring, but you do have the option to put a Band-Aid on things if you want to. If you decide not to get to the release and not to get to the root cause, that's okay, and that is your decision, but there are not many options to fully correct what you're going through. Yes, there is myofunctional therapy. There is speech therapy. There are all of these other things. And some of those things are needed in absence of a tie being present. Speech language pathology is absolutely wonderful medical profession that is absolutely needed. And sometimes it's needed in absence of a tie. But if a tie is present and you choose not to correct it, while all of these other modalities may help you compensate with your tie, it will never correct the problem. So for my daughter, we, outside of the first like week or so breastfeeding was the only time that we really ever noticed any sort of like oral issue. And then later on now, she's almost six. She snores at night and has like more cavities than any of my other children, which is easy because my other children have zero. And so now we're doing like healthy starts with her to help with her tongue positioning. Do you think that her tongue position could be related to a tie or maybe is this another just airway issue for her? Like, does every airway issue mean tongue tie? So not all airway issues are tongue tie related. Some of them could be because your child sucked their thumb for so long or used a pacifier for so long. They now have this, you know, open bite and a high arch palate and their tongue simply can't get up that high because it's so high up there. And sometimes they just need correctional help. It doesn't necessarily have to be due to a tongue tie. 
However, if your baby is two weeks old and they haven't had any of these outside factors affecting growth yet, then yes, I would say it's likely that those symptoms are coming from a tie. But can I say it's always a tie? No, absolutely not. Some people just have abnormal swelling in their tonsils and adenoids or have a septal deviation because they broke their nose during swimming and now it's causing breathing and sleep issues. And so no, the root cause is not always a tie, but I have to say in my very short years of practicing that typically ties do contribute to the issues, but no, not always. So what recommendations do you have, if any, let's say someone really loves their provider, their pediatrician, um, or even their dentist, and those particular providers are not really on board or informed about ties. Is there a website for resources that we can go to to find, um, to kind of do our own research to find what's in our area, or are there some accounts that you would recommend following? Like, what would you say to the parents who are like, I don't really have the support of my medical team? but I really don't want to change pediatricians, but I do want to address this. So first, I think advocating for yourself can be super difficult and also very anxiety-inducing because going against a professional is never easy. But allowing them the open book of saying, hey, this is what I've been learning. I would love for your opinion on X, Y, or Z research article. Here's a copy of it. Please let me know what you think. That's a good way to start. Some great resources are the Breathe Institute. Like I said, Dr. Zaghi and his team have put out many, many research articles that are absolutely compelling and tell a world of stories through very measured, calculated research. A husband and wife team, right? Yes. So Dr. Zaghi and his wife, Nora, she is a pediatric dentist and he is an ENT. They are wonderful. I got to train with them in December and um, shout out to you guys. Hey, I know you're listening. Um, (laughs) They have just been an absolute inspiration for me. Dr. Baxter, again, with the Tongue Tai Institute down in Alabama, he is also wonderful. Dr. Chelsea Pinto, she is also through the Breathe Institute. They have a whole Breathe Babies course out there. There are wonderful affiliates that have been with the Breathe Institute. So finding a Breathe affiliate or a Breathe ambassador is a good way to go. Also, just finding someone, honestly, that has training in sleep. The American Board of Sleep Medicine also has a, a like a dental side of things. So finding someone that is trained in that, in any sort of sleep medicine, is typically a good place to go as well. But truly, sometimes, you know, people just get stuck in their ways and you can't change opinions and that's okay. And seeking other care is necessary. It sounds like we're really just changing the conversation. It reminds me of what happened in PT where we just started saying like, hey, if you're having leaking when you're moving, like that's actually might be common, but that's not really ideal. And like, let's dive into it. And now the world of pelvic health has really expanded and bloomed. And now it just feels like some parallels for me where we're saying like, oh, the things that we just accepted before, like pain, breastfeeding is painful. Well, now we're not really accepting that or you know, just different things. Everybody has crooked teeth. Some of the, we're really challenging some of those paradigms, which is, you know, kind of cool learning more and seeing how the fields evolve. But that also does feel like lend to us not having always the support of older generations because they're like, we never had that. That wasn't a thing. Like, well, you know, a little bit of like, no better, do better. Or maybe we didn't know that. And now we do, which is, you know, frightening, but also cool. I feel like that's with like all medical though, is like it's constantly changing, but it takes so long for the newer research to actually be implemented into actual practice. So similar like how people probably in the past used scissors all the time, but now they know lasers are a little bit better, but people are still using scissors, I'm sure, in practice. Is there like something like why someone would prefer to use those scissors versus using a laser? Like maybe is it just like lack of knowledge that the laser is superior or like maybe they just are super comfortable with scissors? So Dr. Zaghi actually uses scissors during his procedure. He uses a combination of scissors and lasers, though. And he told us that's just because that's what he feels comfortable with. You know, that's what he was trained on, and that's what he knows best. It's kind of like if you were taught how to ride a bike with training wheels, and then all of a sudden they're like, oh, just kidding, you're now going to ride a unicycle. (laughs) 
You know, there's a big learning jump to that. And so he does use a combination of laser and scissors depending on the case and how it's going. And sometimes he will just use the laser. But the biggest thing to look at is their success rate and how are their cases turning out. And so, yes, someone may use just scissors. I would argue that they would probably have better success incorporating a laser in there. But again, the success rates is truly what matters. So kind of wrapping up all of our thoughts today. So a tongue tie is, and any tethered oral tissue, is an abnormal amount of fascia in the area restricting movement and adequate function of that tissue. And so some signs and symptoms of a tongue tie, of course, is our sleep disordered breathing that we talked about, but also feeding and speech issues, as well as head and neck tension, headaches and migraines. Again, there are an entire list of issues that we can link in the show notes, and you definitely should seek help from a provider to find out if your symptoms could be related to your tie. If you're experiencing symptoms but don't have a tongue tie diagnosis, I would urge you to find another provider. You may have one of those quote unquote hidden ties, the infamous posterior tongue tie, which only a truly trained and well-educated provider is able to find. And sometimes you just have to find a provider that is able to do that for you. Long-term consequences of a tongue tie can include things like consistent head and neck tension, migraine, pain, inability to function and move appropriately. Maybe you have trouble hitting that yoga pose that you have been meaning to hit your whole life. Maybe you have GI issues and, of course, snoring and other sleep-disordered breathing. Again, tongue ties, yes, they have just started being talked about more commonly in our culture and in our population right now, but I urge you to look and reflect in on yourself. You know, yes, we can survive with tongue ties. We have been for a long time, but are we thriving? Are we sleeping well? Are we eating well? Are we functioning well? And what can we do to better our life for the time we have left on this earth? And I hope that with the knowledge that we have shared with you today, you are able to kind of evaluate yourself, your family, and also have the encouragement and confidence to bring this up to your providers. So thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing your expertise. I know that we had a really great conversation the other day that was not recorded on this podcast that really inspired us to want to share your knowledge with everyone else. Hopefully this podcast episode was not completely overwhelming for you. Just know that you are doing a great job with the information that you have. Not everyone needs their tongue tie revised. If your baby has a tongue tie and they're not experiencing any symptoms, you're not ruining them for life. But just being aware of more how helps you make better decisions for yourself and for your family. This podcast is sponsored by Needed, a nutrition company focused on optimal nourishment for your perinatal journey. You can use code MAMASTAYPOD for 20% off your first order.